Well, welcome back. The title of our study for this session is Are Protestants an Endangered Species? But before we study, we want to ask for the Lord's blessing. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we're going to study a very important subject. And we need the help of your Holy Spirit. So we ask that you will be present here with us through your Holy Spirit. You will give us understanding. And you will help us, Lord, to see the urgency of the times that we're living in. Certainly prophecies being fulfilled, being fulfilled before our very eyes, right and left. Help us, Lord, to stand for you in these times. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two things that will eventually bring Protestants back to the Mother Church, as the Roman Catholic Church is known. Number one is that the Protestant denominations never have been able to sever their doctrinal relationship with the Roman Catholic Church in several doctrines. I'm speaking particularly of two doctrines that Protestants were never able to get rid of. Number one, the observance of Sunday as the day of rest. And number two, the idea of the immortality of the soul. Protestants, beginning with the Protestant reformers, were never able to deliver or free themselves from these two great errors of the papacy. That's the reason why Ellen White explains that these two doctrines are going to join Protestants, Catholics, and worldings. I read from Great Controversy, page 588. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, that is the state of the dead, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome, that's Sunday. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country, the United States, will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So you notice that she mentions two doctrines that will eventually join Protestantism, Catholicism, and spiritualism. The state of the dead, the idea that the Roman Catholic Church has, along with Protestants, that the dead aren't dead, the immortality of the soul, and secondly, the idea that Sunday is God's sacred day of worship. So doctrinally, because Protestants were not able to get rid of everything all of the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, they will come back to mother. I want to read you a statement by John O'Brien. For many years, he was a theology professor at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. And uh, in this statement, he makes a very interesting remark about Protestants and the mother church. This is how it reads. But since Saturday, not Sunday is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course it is inconsistent. But this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. And by that time, the custom was universally observed. They, that is Protestants, have continued the custom of keeping Sunday, even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. And now, here comes the key portion. That observance of Sunday by Protestants remains as a reminder of the Mother Church from which the non-Catholic sects broke away. Like a boy running away from home, but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother 
or a lock of her hair. Are you understanding the point? When you don't run away from home for good, you're bound to return because you have the tokens of remembrance of the mother. The second reason why Protestants will return to mother is because they have not stood for that which their ancestors were willing to die. They have shifted their interpretation of Bible prophecy. Not only do they reflect the papacy in certain key doctrines, the state of the dead and the Sabbath, but they also have adopted a counterfeit system of interpreting Bible prophecy. They no longer believe that the man of sin, the abomination of desolation, the harlot, the little horn, the king of the north, the beast, the antichrist, represents the Roman Catholic Church. And because they don't believe that all of these prophecies were fulfilled in, with the Roman Catholic papacy, they no longer fear the papacy because they have forgotten their roots. You see, they believe that the papacy has changed. But let me say that, uh, that a system and a person never changes its DNA. When it has its DNA, it has that DNA once and for all. Ellen White explained the genius, if you please, used in a qualified sense of the papacy. In Great Controversy, page 571, she wrote, It is part of Rome's policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she hides the invariable venom of the serpent. So you notice that, that the Roman Catholic papacy uses camouflage. And Protestants have bought into the doctrines, some of the doctrines of Roman Catholicism, and they have adopted her prophetic method of interpreting the prophecies of the Bible. Now, the relationships between Roman Catholics and Protestants began to seriously thaw at Vatican Council II. The various Protestant denominations were invited to be there to, as observers. Vatican Council II took place between 1962 and 1965. And I want to read a couple of statements. One is by John 23, who was the one who started the council. Then he died, and Pope Paul VI finished the, this ecumenical council from 1962 to 1965. I want to read the words of John, Pope John 23 to the Protestants that came to Vatican II. This is what he, he said. The Roman Catholic Church desires to be an affection, affectionate, kind, and patient mother. She is moved by compassion and goodness towards her alienated children. Referring to the Protestants. And of course, the Protestants were carrying a lock of her hair, <laughs> a memento to remember, to, to remind them of their mother. Uh, Pope Paul VI, who uh, took the place of Pope John XXIII, also referred to Protestants and the Mother Church. This is how his uh, words were given to the Protestants. Because of their position, Separated brethren are the object of deep and tender affection on the part of the mother church. It is a love that feels grief and sadness, the love of a heart wounded by estrangement, because the estrangement prevents our brethren, that is Protestants, from enjoying so many privileges and rights and makes them lose so much grace. But perhaps for this very reason, its love, the Roman Catholic Church's love, is all the deeper and more burning towards Protestants. So notice that this is a case of two popes speaking about the mother and the alienated children of the mother and the separated brethren. As a result of Vatican Council II, Protestants began to change their view of the Roman Catholic papacy. Before that, they held the papacy under great suspicion. But after that, they began having dialogues and studies on a scholarly level between Protestants and Roman Catholics. Now what I want to do in the next several minutes 
is read you statements from several prominent Protestants uh, after Vatican Council II about the mother, about the Roman Catholic Church. This never would have happened in the times of Ellen White. This never would have happened in the days of Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. But Protestantism had changed after Vatican II. Let me read you from Chuck Colson. Maybe you've never heard of Chuck Colson. He was one of the individuals involved in the Watergate uh, uh, affair. And he actually spent s several years in prison. And he's head of Prison Ministries International, which is a good work that, that he has done. But he wrote in Keith Fournier's book, Evangelical Catholics. Keith Fournier was uh, actually Roman Catholic, and he wrote a book, Evangelical Catholics. I want to read you three statements that Chuck Colson wrote in the introduction to this book written by a Roman Catholic. It's high time that all of us who are Christians come together, regardless of the differences of our confessions and our traditions, and make common cause to bring Christian values to bear in our society. When the barbarians are scaling the walls, there is no time for petty quarreling in the camp. So he's saying we need to come together regardless of our differences to embrace a common cause. He also wrote, but at root, those who are called of God, whether Catholic or Protestant, are part of the same body. Interesting that he would say we're all part of the same body. What they share is a belief in the basics. Now, there's Protestants and Catholics share a belief in the basics. What are those basics? He says the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, his bodily resurrection, his imminent return, and the authority of his infallible word. They also share the same mission, presenting Christ as Savior and Lord to a needy world. I beg to differ that Protestants have the same mission as the Roman Catholic Church. And I seriously beg to differ that Catholics and Protestants share the same view on these doctrines that he mentions. The Roman Catholic Church does not believe that the Bible is God's authoritative word. They believe that tradition has to be added to have the complete picture. In another statement, Chuck Colson, this very influential person, wrote, I pray that this book, the book written by this Roman Catholic, Keith Fournier, the name of the book is Evangelical Catholics. He says, I pray that this book will be read by Catholics and Protestants alike, that it will be a bridge across many of the historic divisions in the church that have weakened our stand in today's culture. Interesting. Build a bridge. Ellen White talks about reaching the hand across the gulf to clasp the hands of Protestants, Catholics, and spiritualists. Let me say a few things about Ralph Reed. He was actually the first uh, president of the Christian Coalition, which was established by Pat Robertson's organization. He gave a speech to the Catholic Campaign for America, which is a Catholic organization. He was invited to give a speech there. I want to read you some of the statements by this evangelical Ralph Reed. By the way, he's very influential. Now he is a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. for Christian causes. I'm going to read several statements that he made. Here is one. Quote, The truth is, you and I are uniting, he's saying to these Protestants. We are coming together because whatever theological differences there are, there is far more that unites us and brings us together then divides us and separates us. The good news is that the chasm is being bridged and that those walls are crumbling. The walls between Protestants and Catholics, he's saying. And then he states, the truth, my friends, is this. Catholicism never has been, is not today, never will be a threat to American democracy. It was and remains the most colorful and most vibrant thread running through the tapestry of American democracy. In another statement, he refers to Cardinal Gibbons, a great cardinal renowned in the United States, and he wrote this. 
Cardinal Gibbons said this. He said, No constitution is more in harmony with Catholic principles than the American Constitution. And no religion is more in accord with that Constitution than the Catholic religion. That's amazing. He's quoting Gibbons and he's approving of what Cardinal Gibbons had to say. Either Ralph Reed is suffering of historical amnesia or else he's openly prevaricating and lying. In the Amarillo Sun, Sunday News Globe for December 10, 1995, uh, Ralph Reed wrote the following, We can no longer afford to be divided. It is a luxury that is no longer ours. So division is a luxury, he says. Then he continues uh, his statement, The left, the political left, wants you and I to be divided. Nothing frightens the left more than Christians shattering the barriers of denomination. One last statement by Ralph Reed. He stated, Obviously, some teachings are more important than others. And there has to be an agreement on those essential points. I want you to remember these statements. Because at the end I'm going to read you some statements from Ellen White that were written 130 years ago. So once again, obviously some teachings are more important than others. And there has to be an agreement on those essential points. While leaving considerable latitude on other points that are less essential to the faith. Let me read you what W.A. Criswell had to say. W.A. Chris, Criswell uh, pastored one of the largest churches in the United States, the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. And he wrote the following. This is quoted in Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast, page 388. This Protestant pastor, Baptist, mind you, wrote, I don't know of anyone more dedicated to the great fundamental doctrines of Christianity than the Catholics. Let me tell you a few things about the late Billy Graham. You know, he's going to be buried very soon. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but um, the assistant evangelist to Billy Graham, when Billy Graham couldn't go to a place, was Emilio Connectly, and uh, he converted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so he knew uh, Billy Graham very well, and, and several times... He said that Billy Graham knew very well uh, the Adventist view of the Sabbath as well as other doctrines. Let me, and, and of course, he knew about the, the Seventh-day Adventist view of the papacy and so on. Billy Graham, of course, was the most admired Protestant minister in the United States until the moment of his death. He counseled presidents, all of the presidents. I don't know which president it begins with, but he was always in the White House praying for presidents, and giving spiritual advice. Let me read you what Billy Graham had to say. I found that my beliefs are essentially the same as those of Orthodox Roman Catholics. That is quoted in A Woman Rides the Beast, page 388. In 1981, Billy Graham hailed the Pope, who was John Paul II at that time, as the greatest moral leader of the world and the world's greatest evangelist. In U.S. News and World Report, we find these words spoken by Billy Graham. And this is for December 19, 1988. He, he said, World travel, travel and getting to know the clergy of all denominations has helped mold me into an ecumenical being. We're separated by theology and in some instances by culture and race, but all that means nothing to me anymore. On the program Good Morning America for August 12, 1993, Billy Graham stated, I admire the Pope. We address the same moral issues. On the program Larry King Live, on CNN in Salt Lake City, January 21, 1998, uh, Larry King interviewed uh, Billy Graham. The Pope had just been named, uh, John Paul II had just been named the Pope. 
And Billy Graham was in Salt Lake City. So Larry King interviewed him. And here's the question and answers. Larry King asked, Do you feel comfortable with Salt Lake City? Do you feel comfortable with the Vatican? Graham answered, Oh, I'm very comfortable with the Vatican. I've been to see the Pope several times. And in fact, the day he was inaugurated, that is made Pope, I was preaching in his cathedral in Krakow. I was his guest. Larry King then asked, You were preaching in his church the day he was made Pope? Billy Graham answered, That is correct, in Krakow. And uh, Billy Graham chuckled when he said that. King then asked him, You must have been shocked. Billy Graham answered, Of course I was. There was shouting on the streets, you know, the next day, Polish Pope, Polish Pope. And then Larry King asked Billy Graham, Do you like the Pope? Billy Graham answered, I like him very much. He's very conservative. He and I agree on almost everything. The dean of evangelists for the last 80 years, or the last 70 years at least, let me mention an ecumenical meeting that took place when Pope Benedict visited the United States. This event took place on Friday, April 18, 2008, at St. Joseph's Church in Manhattan, New York. The Vatican had invited to come there 250 Protestant leaders from all denominations. Represented there were United Methodists, Evangelical Lutherans, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, the National Association of Evangelicals, Presbyterians, the Reformed Church, the National Baptist Convention, various Pentecostal groups, the Greek Orthodox, Armenian, and Episcopalian, even the Mormons were represented there. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was not represented at that ecumenical meeting. Fifteen of the prominent leaders were invited to go and greet the Pope as he stood there on the platform, these 15 leaders filed one by one to go by the Pope. I saw this with my own eyes. It was unbelievable. These leaders would come and they would shake his hand. Some of them would bow and then they would whisper kind words to Benedict XVI. In spite of the fact that Benedict XVI wrote very clearly that Protestant churches are not real Christian churches. And yet you had these 250 prominent religious leaders in the United States going to that meeting. And by the way, Pope Francis, uh, if you go to the internet, you'll be able to find this. In Rome, in two different events, he sat on a throne, a white throne, and on each side of the throne, there was a cherub. Now, isn't that interesting? Because Psalm 80 verse 1 says that God sits between the cherubim. And here these Protestants are, are going there and not fearing the papacy at all because they are returning to the papacy on common points of doctrine, Sunday, as well as the state of the dead, the two great doctrines, and because they no longer fear the papacy, because they have adopted the Roman Catholic view of Bible prophecy. Let me mention a meeting that took place uh, at a convention that was organized by a man by the name of Kenneth Copeland. Have you ever heard of Kenneth Copeland? I'm sure that you've heard about the Tony Palmer affair. I'm going to share those details with you because there might be some people here who don't know all of the details about this. Tony Palmer... He died in a motorcycle accident shortly after this, was an Anglican clergyman of the Celtic tradition. And he lamented the fact that his own church, the Anglican church, had splintered into many, many different groups. The Anglican church was divided into all kinds of factions, offshoots everywhere. And so he longed for not only the Anglican church, but also for the Protestant churches to come together. And so... He was invited in February of 2014 
to a conference that was organized by Kenneth Copeland. Now, you need to understand that Kenneth Copeland has a lot of clout in the United States. He has millions of followers. He's one of these television evangelists. And so Palmer was invited to give a speech there at Kenneth Copeland's convention. And this took place February 25, 2014. Tony Palmer began by saying that he had come in the spirit and power of Elijah to bring the hearts of the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons. In other words, with the intention of uniting Protestants and Catholics. In his address, he lamented that 500 years after the Reformation, Protestantism had split into 33,000 different denominations and religious entities. And then he said, diversity is divine, division is diabolic. And then he went on to affirm that God had given charismatics the glory so that they might be one. And by the way, when I say charismatics, a Kenneth Copeland is a charismatic. On television, sometimes he actually speaks in a language that no one understands. And I believe that God himself doesn't understand the language he's speaking in. But anyway, uh, Tony Palmer continued saying this, It is the glory that glues us together, not the doctrine. Interesting. In other words, we all have a common experience. Doctrine doesn't matter. So he says, it is the glory that glues us together, not the doctrine. It's the glory. If you accept that the glory of God is living in me, and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrine later upstairs. Christian unity is the basis of our credibility. Because Jesus said that until we are one, the world will not believe. Now in 1999, Roman Catholics um, and Protestants, specifically the Lutherans, had signed what is known as the Joint Declaration on Righteousness by Faith. And basically the Lutherans said, you know, the, the, the debate between Luther and the Roman Catholic Church was mostly on a debate over semantics. But really, there wasn't that much difference between Luther and the Roman Catholic Church. Interesting that it would, they would wait till 1999 to say such a thing. And so he lamented in his speech, Palmer did, that only the um, Lutherans, and at that point, the Methodists had signed the Joint Declaration on Righteousness by Faith. He says, where are all of the other Protestant groups in signing this declaration, this Joint Declaration? And then he stated, speaking about Luther's Protestant movement, he said, brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours? And then after lamenting, as I mentioned, that no evangelical church had signed this joint declaration between Catholics and Lutherans, he said, this must be fixed. The protest has been over for 15 years. If there is no longer any protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe now we are all Catholics again. Isn't this amazing? Then, of course, we know that Tony Palmer was a good friend of Pope Francis I. Uh, he visited him many times. And so before this convention, he had gone to visit Pope Francis I, and he told him, you know, I'm going to have this, I'm going to be at this big convention, this big charismatic convention. I would like you to send a message to the people that are coming, hundreds of them, leaders of the charismatic movement. And so Tony Palmer took out his cell phone, and he recorded on the cell phone a message from Francis I to those who were attending this convention. And uh, I, I want to uh, read here what the Pope had to say to those who came to the convention. He said, I am yearning that this separation comes to an end and gives us communion. I am yearning for that embrace. At the end of his message, the Pope spoke to those who had come to Kenneth Copeland's convention saying this, please pray for me. I need your prayers and I will pray for you, but I need your prayers. And let's pray that the Lord, that he unites us all. 
Come on, we are brothers. Let's give each other a spiritual hug and let God complete the work that he has begun. And this is a miracle. The miracle of unity has begun. I ask you to bless me. I bless you. From brother to brother, I embrace you. After the Pope delivered his message, the delegates stood and clapped and cheered. And Kenneth Copeland went to the stage repeating the same phrase over and over again, glory, 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 glory. And he stated, we do not know how to pray for him as we ought. Referring to the Pope. He says, we don't really know how to pray for the Pope. And so now, uh, Kenneth Copeland begins praying in an unknown tongue for the Pope. At the end of uh, his, at the end of his prayer, he said to Tony Palmer, Tony, bring your cell phone because I want to record a message for you to take to the Pope. And let me read the message that was recorded by Kenneth Copeland to send back to the Pope with Tony Palmer. I quote, These leaders, the ones that were at the convention, represent literally tens of thousands that love you, that believe that God is with you. And in answer to your request, we have just prayed for you and with you, and we did so in the Spirit. We do bless you. We receive your blessing. It is very, very important to us. And we bless you with all our hearts. We bless you with all our souls. We bless you with all our might. By the way, who does that apply to? God. And he ended by saying, And we thank you, sir. We thank God for you. And so, all of us declare, Be blessed. Would something like this have happened in the period of the Reformation? Absolutely not. But because Protestants share many of the common views with the papacy, Sunday, the immortality of the soul, among other things, and because they have totally forgotten that the Antichrist would appear when the Roman Empire was divided, and that points to the papacy, they have a different system of interpreting prophecy, they no longer have any fear of the Roman Catholic papacy, and therefore they see no reason not to unite with the papacy. You know, after this uh, specific episode between Tony Palmer and uh, Kenneth Copeland and the Pope, the Pope started inviting prominent Protestant leaders to come and visit him at the Vatican. One of those was James Robeson. He is a very influential television personality. Uh, he has a program called Life Today. He has thousands and thousands of followers across the United States. He was invited to go visit the Pope, Pope Francis I. I want to read you what, can, what uh, James Robeson said to the Pope. Pope Francis, let me say to you, that I see Jesus in you. And in Christ we are brothers. We are family. Thank you for speaking the language of love. That all may come to know him and love him and love one another. And then he, he asked for permission whether the Pope would be willing to give him a high five. And for the first time in history, Pope Francis I and James Robeson hit each other's hands in a high five. On May 5, 2014, uh, Tony Palmer was invited to be at uh, the program Life Today with James Robeson. And this is what Tony Palmer had to say at James Robeson's pro uh, program. Diversity is divine. It is division that is diabolic. Jesus' theology... Notice how superficial he sees Jesus' theology. Jesus' theology is that if God is in you, and you are in God, and God is in me, and I am in God, we are one together in God. Well, that's profound, isn't it? <laughs> I'm being sarcastic in case you didn't catch it. And then he said, our sin is that we don't make our unity visible. 
because we allow our diversities to divide us. And if we elevate anything to divide us, we are elevating it above the cross. So whether it is a doctrine or a dogma or an expression, if you use that to divide our unity, you have elevated that doctrine or whatever it may be above the cross. Now, we are not saying put doctrine aside. Certainly not. Pope Francis recognizes only two fundamental doctrines. Love for God and love for your neighbor. End of doctrine. So what he's saying is that the only doctrines that are important are love for God and love for your fellow men. And Protestants and Catholics need to join together and just set aside all of the other differences. Another individual that was invited to go visit the Pope was Joel Osteen. Ever heard of him? He fills a, a former basketball coliseum of the Houston Rockets three times on Sundays to maximum capacity. He has three services at least there. And he was invited to go to the Vatican as well after uh, Kenneth Copeland's convention. He was the Pope's guest. And in an interview, Joel Osteen said about his visit, I just felt very honored and very humbled. He continued, it was amazing. And even to go back into that part of the Vatican, there's so much history there. You better believe there is. There's so much history there. The place that they took us through, you feel that deep respect and reverence for God. And then Joel Osteen attended a mass that was celebrated in St. Peter's Square. There were about 100,000 people gathered there when Pope Francis celebrated the Mass. And this is what Joel Osteen said about that experience. Afterward, the Pope spent an hour and a half going through the crowd with the Pope Mobile greeting the people. It was very heartwarming to see him caring for people. I love the fact that he's made the church more inclusive, not trying to make it smaller, but to try to make it larger, larger to take everybody in. So that just resonates with me. Do you think, folks, that if Protestantism had stuck to its prophetic principles, that any of these individuals would be saying things such as this? They would never say this if they believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. They don't believe that anymore. They've forsaken their roots of the Protestant Reformation. Lutherans, all of the churches have forsaken their roots. And that's why I said that if Martin Luther resurrected today, he would die of a heart attack when he saw what has happened to the church that he founded. Let me mention a few things about Rick Warren. Ever heard about him? He wrote two bestsellers, The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life which, by the way, are used very prominently in many Seventh-day Adventist churches, I might say. He's the pastor of a large megachurch in Southern California. Time magazine, several years ago, said that Rick Warren was the ideal individual to take the place of Billy Graham when Billy Graham passed away. Rick Warren was also invited to go to the Vatican to visit the Pope. In November of 2014, Rick Warren said this about the relationship between Catholics and Protestants. He said, we have far more in common than what divides us. And then he stated this, Catholics and Protestants would all say, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the resurrection, we believe in salvation through Jesus Christ. These are the big issues, he went on. Sometimes Protestants think that Catholics worship Mary like she's another god. But that's not exactly Catholic doctrine. Believe me, it might not be the doctrines of the scholars, but the common folk do believe that they're worshiping Mary. I have gone to many Roman Catholic cathedrals as I see faithful Roman Catholics bowing before images of Mary and praying to her. He continues saying, people say, what are the saints all about? Why are you praying to the saints? 
And when you understand what they mean by what they are saying, there's a whole lot of commonality that we have with Catholics. There still are real differences, no doubt about that. But the most important thing is, if you love Jesus, we are on the same team. When it comes to the family, we are co-workers in the field, in this, in this field for the protection of the sanctity of life, the sanctity of sex, and the sanctity of marriage. So, there's a great commonality, and there's no division on any of those three. There have also been ecumenical documents that have been signed. The Pope uh, went to um, Malmo, Sweden, a year before the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and there the Lutherans and the Pope signed an agreement. Furthermore, the Joint Declaration on Righteousness by Faith was signed between Lutherans and Roman Catholics in 1999. A little bit earlier, a document was signed, Evangelicals and Catholics together, saying that they should all cooperate in sharing the gospel. And as we know, uh, Pope Francis gave a speech before a joint session of the Congress of the United States without a single ounce of fear on the part of any of the politicians who were present there. As is known, Pope Francis has made it the top of his agenda to try and unite the Christian world, to try and unite Protestants. He has had meeting after meeting, he has visited country after country with the intention of joining Protestants together. Now let me read you, before we come to the conclusion of our study, some statements that were written by Ellen G. White. They were written in 1888 when Protestants and Catholics did not get along at all. Protestants looked at Roman Catholics with tremendous suspicion. Ellen White prophetically said, this is going to change. It's like she's writing now what she wrote back then. I'm going to uh, take the time to write, to read several statements of Ellen White from the book Great Controversy. And one of them will be from the book Maranatha. Quote, Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. The papacy says this is too good to be true. Here they're making these compromises and, and concessions. We can't understand it. The very Catholics can't understand this. She continued, Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused. Notice, people need to know about this. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. She wrote in Great Controversy, page 500, 445, when the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, did we notice some of the Protestant leaders in recent times saying that? Yes. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrines as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. In Great Controversy, page 40, 444, the page right before the one that I just read, she states, the wide diversity of belief in the Protestant churches is regarded by many as decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced uniformity can ever be made. But there has been for years in churches of the Protestant faith a strong and growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon 
common points of doctrine. To secure such a union, listen carefully, to secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which all were not agreed, however important they might be, from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. In other words, set aside. It's amazing that she would write this in 1888. And what we read from the great Protestant leaders is very similar in recent times. The reason why is because the Great Controversy is an inspired book. It's a prophetic book. God revealed this to Ellen White in vision and in dreams. And what she said is transpiring. If you read the book Great Controversy, which by the way, Ellen White said that she would want that book more than any other book that she wrote to go to the general public. If you read that book, it's like reading in many ways the newspaper today because what she predicted is being fulfilled to the very letter. In Great Controversy, pages 565 and 566, she wrote, Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. Why are they in darkness? For two reasons. Number one, they were never able to get rid of every vestige of union with the Catholic Church, doctrinal union. And secondly, because they have forsaken the historicist method of interpreting prophecy, which identifies the papacy as the Antichrist of Scripture. So she writes, the Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Did you notice two words that she uses in this statement? To regain control of the world. What would that mean? What does the word regain mean? It means to get back. Did the papacy have that power once before? When? During the 1260 years. She says now the papacy is what? The papacy is struggling to regain control of the world to reestablish, what does reestablish mean? Same thing, to recover, to re reestablish persecution and undo all that Protestantism has done. Is the papacy being quite successful, would you say? Very, very successful. Here's another statement uh, by Ellen White. This is in Great Controversy, page 581. Rome is aiming, aiming to re-establish her power, to recover her lost supremacy. Let the principle once be established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if it had not been for the evangelicals, Donald Trump would not be president of the United States. He catered to the conservative Protestants. 83% of them voted for Donald Trump. And he made them many interesting promises. I don't know if he's going to keep all those promises. But one of those promises was to get rid of the Johnson Amendment, which was approved by Congress in the year 1954, which forbids nonprofit organizations from taking sides for one political party or the other, or one political candidate and the other. Secrets Unsealed is an officially incorporated nonprofit organization. We have a 501c3 status. We cannot take sides on, uh, you know, for one political party or the other political party, one candidate or the other candidate, because we would lose our tax-exempt status, according to the Johnson Amendment. 
one of the promises that Donald Trump made was to get rid of the Johnson Amendment so that nonprofit organizations, by the way, all churches that are incorporated are nonprofit organizations, so that they can take the sides of political parties. You know what that would do? That would entangle the church with the state and the state with the church. Political candidates would cater to the churches to get votes, and churches would cater to the candidates so that the candidates would give them money. It would entangle both of them. Now, Donald Trump has not yet taken the step of abolishing the Johnson Amendment. However, he has told the IRS, go soft on those who support political candidates, don't prosecute, which is basically, in practical terms, the same thing as abolishing this particular amendment. I want to read another statement that we find in the book Maranatha, page 216. The people of the United States have been a favored people. Would you agree with that? You know, when I, when I see the abundance that the United States has, it is simply amazing. Abundance of everything. And then you look like a, at a country like Venezuela, where my friend Juan Reyes is from. They have people eating out of the garbage. They can't find medicines. People are dying of illnesses because there's no medicines. People, people have to stand in lines for all day just to get a bag of rice. This country has been so blessed by the Lord. And Ellen White says the people of the United States have been a favored people. But when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countenance to popery, the measure of their guilt will be full and national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of this apostasy will be national ruin. In fact, Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, what the secret of the power and prosperity of the United States is. She said the secret of the power and prosperity of the United States is not that it has more money, that it has more territory, that it has a more powerful military, that people are more intelligent, she says the secret of its power and prosperity are the two principles upon which the United States was built. Republicanism and Protestantism, separation of church and state, which has been the Protestant view since the Reformation. The Roman Catholic papacy says no, not a separation of church and state, the union of church and state. And eventually the United States will buy into this and national apostasy will be written in the books of heaven and it will be followed by national ruin. I want to read one closing statement before we end. This is in the book Maranatha, page 179. It's a sad statement. When the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for His people, that they might worship Him according to the dictates of their own consciences, the land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread, the land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ, when that land, through its legislators, abjure, that means abandon, the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy in tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy by a national act. What is a national act? It's an act of Congress, folks. By a national act enforcing the false Sabbath because Protestants were never able to get rid of the false Sabbath. She says, by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath, notice the terminology now, they will give life and vigor why would the papacy need life and vigor? What does it have? A deadly wound. That's right. They will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, reviving. What does it mean to revive? Can you revive that which didn't receive a deadly wound? No. Reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience, then it will be time for God to work in mighty power 
for the vindication of his truth. What do you think? Are we living in prophetic times? How do we know that? Because we have a certain method of interpreting prophecy. We, can, we know what's happening. Because prophecy tells us that the papacy is going to receive power again. And it's the beast that rises from the earth with the two horns like a lamb that is going to give the power back. And then the United States will make an image of the first beast. It's going to join church and state like the first beast. That's the image of the beast. It will reflect what the papacy was. And then the papacy will be able to persecute again because we can see the trajectory of prophecy, folks. And because the Adventist church has totally separated its doctrines from the papacy, including the state of the dead and the day of worship. Protestantism, on the other hand, has kept a lock of the hair of her mother, so to speak, and has accepted the shift in prophetic interpretation. And therefore, Protestantism is totally powerless today when it speaks about Bible prophecy. In our next study together, the title will be Historicism's Last Stand. We are going to take a look at the fact that there is only one church in the world that has the correct method of interpreting prophecy, and that is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is the method of historicism, or what I like to call the historical flow method, that follows the sequence of Bible prophecy, the chain of prophecy that has certain links. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the pagan Roman Empire, Rome divided into ten, then the papacy ruling 1260 years, receiving a deadly wound. At that same time, the second beast rises. It guarantees civil and religious liberty, the two horns. But then it helps the first beast recover its power, and the result is the restriction of civil and religious liberty and the time of trouble such as never has been seen. Is that a correct way of interpreting prophecy? It's the method, folks. The Adventist church is historicism's last stand. And the devil knows it. And that's the reason why Satan, to a great degree, has distracted our church from the message that we should be proclaiming. We're all caught up in side issues. We're preaching the sermons of evangelicals. We're preaching sermons on the parables. Nothing wrong with the parables. They're okay. But we're preaching sermons that could be preached in any evangelical church when we should be proclaiming the three angels' messages and the prophetic message that God has given to our church. May that be our experience, is my prayer.